Good afternoon, everyone. We're so pleased to have you all join us for the inaugural session of the Tiger Dialogues, co-hosted by WWF India Panthera and WCS India. This series marks the year of the tiger in the Chinese lunar calendar. 2022 is also a momentous year for tiger conservation. It is the year by which the political leadership of 13 tiger range states had affirmed to realize the ambitious goal of doubling tiger numbers. This call to action has undoubtedly helped foster the species recovery in several areas. But the status of tiger still remains very precarious in many regions. So 2022 is also a year for us to collectively reflect on the past and draw up new strategies and galvanize new partnerships for tiger conservation in the decades ahead. Much has been spoken and written about the remarkable story of the decline of tigers in Colombia and tiger conservation in post-independence India. And yet, many questions linger. The Tiger Dialogues will raise and dwell upon questions such as, why is it that despite the country's successes, <clears throat> successes against all odds in reversing the fortunes of tigers in many areas, populations still remain on the brink in large parts of India, including within several tiger reserves? How can we make sense of marked spatial variation and uncertainty about trends in tiger numbers? And how can such information be used to plan for the species future? Is it possible to ascribe successes in tiger conservation to coexistence between people and tigers? Is coexistence durable in the long term, given growing human and tiger populations in several regions of India? How best can we sustain tiger populations in landscapes triated by a rapidly growing network of highways and other infrastructure? Or is the extinction of some populations in isolated habitats inevitable? Finally, what lessons can we draw from the past that can help us set aside areas for tiger conservation while also guaranteeing the human rights of indigenous and marginalized residents within conservation landscapes? Today's Tiger Dialogue session, titled Two Centuries of Hunting and Five Decades of Conservation, brings together historians and conservationists who will deliberate on how the past can be instructive for tiger conservation in our times. <coughs> I'd now like to invite our moderator, Raza Kazmi, to introduce the session and our distinguished panelists. But first, I'd like to introduce Raza. Raza Kazmi's field of expertise, fields of expertise include the wildlife history of India, conservation policy, and conservation issues in the country's red corridor landscape. His work focuses on the interplay between forest governance and nationalism on the one hand, and Adivasi rights and conservation needs on the other. His writings have appeared in the Hindu, the Indian Express, the Vaya, Sanctuary Asia, Round Glass Sustain, Seminar, Journal of the Bombay National History Society and other national history and wildlife journals. He has also contributed essays to edited anthologies. A recipient of the New India Foundation Fellowship for 2020, he is working on a book tentatively titled The First of the Nine, The Story of Palamau Tiger Reserve. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Raza. Um, look forward to a productive session. Thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pranav. Um, and that was a wonderful introduction about what this Tiger Dialogue series is all about. Um, so I welcome all of you to the inaugural series uh, session of this series. Um, since we'll be talking a lot about the past in this session, especially the colonial era, um, I'm reminded of this um, rather interesting quote by Winston Churchill, who among other things was a staunch colonialist. He had once said that the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you can see. Perhaps, you know, we can never be sure of the future as Churchill himself found out during his lifetime. Um, and I might have a lot of bones to pick with him uh, on, on multiple uh, issues. But I, I sort of agree with the sentiment behind this quote, uh, given the importance of history as a discipline. Um, tiger conservation or conservation in general is no different much of what our present day con conservation circumstances are and policies are is often dictated by the events um, and processes initiated in the past 
especially the one started by the British as they emerged as the supreme political power across the Indian subcontinent and much of South and Southeast Asia. Through the discussion today with our panel, uh, consisting of uh, India's, or should I say rather, world's foremost environmental historians, one of the tallest conservationists of our era, and one of the finest serving forest officers we have in our country. We hope not just to come out more enlightened about the past for wildlife, tigers especially, but also about our present and how we can use the learning from our past uh, to, you know, uh, bring a, bring about a change and uh, in the current day conservation decision making to ensure a future for tigers in landscapes with fractured geographies and intertwined histories. So I'm sure most of you already know them well, but nonetheless, let me just quickly run through the introductions of our wonderful panel. Uh, professor Vijay Ramdas Mandla is uh, Assistant Professor in the Department of History at the University of Hyderabad. His research interests are environment and empire, commonwealth history, animal studies, colonial government, uh, governance, cultural geography, environmental history of the Gons and the Begars. These are two central Indian uh, tribes, um, colonial education and architecture, and French Revolution of 1789. He has published articles um, in many reputed peer-reviewed journals. Um, then we have, and, and he's author, also the author of this fantastic book called Shooting a Tiger that was published by uh, Oxford. Um, so you, you should maybe check that book out once, once you've done with this session. Uh, we then have uh, Dr. M.K. Ranji Singhjala. Um, you know, he's one of the tallest conservationists of our country. He joined the Indian Administrative Services in 1961. He served in various important posts like the Secretary of Forest and Tourism in Madhya Pradesh from 70 to 73. Director of Wildlife Reservation, uh, 73 to 75. He's the author of several books on Indian wildlife and conservation, uh, the Indian backpack, Indian wildlife, Beyond the Tiger, Portraits of Asian Wildlife, and others. Uh, his most recent being uh, Life with Wildlife. He has also served as chairman of the Wildlife Trust of India, director and regional coordinator of WWF Tiger Conservation Program, regional advisor in the Nature Conservation uh, Asia and Pacific for United Nations Environment Program, trustee to the Corbett Foundation, member of National Forest Commission, Institute of Forest Management Society, International Tropical Timber Organization, Madhya Pradesh, and, and of Madhya Pradesh State Wildlife Board until 2006. He has a lot of uh, organizations he has been associated with. Uh, Dr. Sonali Ghosh is the topper of the Indian Forest Batch of 2000-2003, uh, and she's armed with a slew of degrees, including postgraduate degrees in forestry and wildlife science, a postgraduate diploma in environmental law from the National Law School of India, and another one in systems management. She has won uh, a doctorate in remote sensing technology concerning habitat suitability for tigers in the Indo-Bhutan Manas landscape, which uh, and Manas happens, you know, Assam, Manas is in Assam and happens, Assam happens to be a parent uh, state cadre. And then Professor Mahesh Rangarajan, uh, he's a professor of environmental studies and history at the Ashoka University, Sonipat Haryana. He was previously professor of modern Indian history at University of Delhi. He has taught at Cornell University, Jadavpur National Center of Biological Sciences. He's also served as the director of Nehru Memorial Museum and Library from 2011 to 15. He has worked as an assistant editor with Telegraph Calcutta. People don't know his, his newspaper background much. Um, and uh, he's, uh, he's the editor of uh, you know, um, multiple books, such as Environment and History, um, as well as on the editorial board of conservation and society. He's the author of Nature and Nation, Nature Without Borders, India's Wildlife History. And he has also co-edited People, Parks and Wildlife Towards Coexistence. Mahesh uh, Rangarajan holds a DPhil from the University of Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. So with those introductions, um, let us get on with the, you know, this exciting session. Um, I would first like to bring in Professor Mahesh Rangarajan here. Uh, Professor, with your breadth and depth of knowledge of history, uh, we would really like you to take us through the story of India's tigers, especially, and you know, wildlife in general as well, from the 19th century right into the era of beginning of conservation in India and leading up eventually to the enactment of several conservation legislations and Project Tiger as well. Um, I know it's a huge period to cover with so many dimensions, but I'm sure that you know, you'll be able to give us a good word. Thank you so much and over to you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Rasa. Thank you, Rasa. Very embarrassing uh, introduction, but uh, I'll let that be. Uh, you know, when Project Tiger was launched, uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi gave a statement in which she said Project Tiger abounds in irony. 
the land that has been famous for this magnificent creature is now leading a fight to save it from extinction. I think we should ask, why does it abound in Ireland? And it's difficult for us, perhaps 50 years later, Dr. Ranjit Singh has lived through that era. I only know it by looking at various documents and papers that the late 60s, early 70s is a very momentous period in Indian history. Uh, uh, Mrs. Gandhi became uh, prime minister in 66. There had been two successive drought failures. Uh, India was highly dependent on uh, food imports. Uh, it is uh, very significant. There was a split in the Congress party. It's a time of great social political upheaval. But this particular period, particularly from uh, 69 to 72, is also a period of very significant, what we would today call environmental awakening. And I think the tiger becomes both a symbol and an index of the tiger. One of this is uh, very clear in the fact that uh, in the 60s, it was possible to come to India, uh, get a shikar outfitter, pay them some 40,000 rupees, go out and bag a tiger. And in the late 60s, there's a very major change. There are very significant voices speaking out in a very different way. Some of them are well known. Our director of Delhi Zoo, Kailash Sankla, was to get the Nehru Fellowship. He wrote a, you know, on the status of the tiger in India, estimated the population at 2,500. Interestingly, he did it by talking to people who manage various forest crops. But there's also a survey by the Bombay National History Society. But I think it's significant that, you know, the tiger became important at this time, both as a symbol of a type of ecological patriotism. You know, it begins to be called in 72, the Indian tiger. It becomes the national animal. It's very significant that when asked why it was the national animal, the chair of the Project Tiger uh, I, and IBWL, Dr. Karan Singh, said it was found in 11 of 16 states. So it would be the symbol of unity in diversity. And we all know there were nine tiger reserves in eight states, and they represented range of habitats. But you know, if you look at the previous 50 years, it's a very different story. Up to 1925, there were regular rewards given out by all the provinces for killing, not only tigers, but various other carnivores. They were not only seen as an impediment to the spread of cultivation. You know, remember the late, late 60s, 70, 80% of the traction power came from bulls and bullocks. And uh, tigers, leopards were seen as harmful because they attacked draft cattle. They were also seen as a threat to human life. And it was also part of the uh, notion of imperial conquest, certainly in British India, that you tried to eliminate many of these large animals to establish the power of the sovereign uh, in India. This is an older practice, goes back to 10 years after Palashi, but definitely from 1870s to 1920s, if you compute bounties, and I'm not looking at spot hunting, some 15, 1600 tigers are killed every year just for rewards. So I think the late 70s is an end of that. And Project Tiger is itself a sort of transition from a very big game centered view of nature, but certainly among imperial officials, or the princes, or the foresters, but towards a somewhat more inclusive idea. So the tiger becomes a symbol of various habitats. And I think it's significant to emphasize it included the mangrove forest of Sundarbans dry deciduous and thorn forests in say Sarista. But uh, one should also keep in mind that tiger was not just about itself. You know, you just look at a photograph, very famous, you know, Lord Curson with Maharaja Walia, ancestor of present members of Sindhya family in politics. And Curson is standing there with five tigers and uh, he compliments Maharaja for bringing him five tigers. But uh, by the 70s, that ethic is changing. You know, the ban on tiger skins is one thing. It becomes very important to photograph it. So a sort of a small political footnote for those who know Gapshap, you know, the only Indian prime minister to date, we've had many, who had shot dead a tiger was Vishnath Pratabs at the age of 40. And he later was quite sort of sheepish and ashamed of it. The first Indian prime minister to photograph a tiger, that is shoot it with a camera, was the man he replaced in office, Rajiv Gandhi. And I'm sure you know it was in Covert National. So I think there is this transition taking place in the 70s. It's not a complete transition. A lot of these issues remain. But the tiger becomes both a symbol of India, national animal. It is also part of India trying a new kind of outreach to the Western world. You know, one shouldn't forget US tilted towards Pakistan in the liberation war of Bangladesh in 71, 72. It's a very infamous act of, of uh, President Nixon. He committed many other infamous acts, of course. But, uh, you know, the European-led uh, uh, WWF was a very important partner with India. 
And uh, the, but the project was conceived and led by Indian officers. And I think this idea that you don't look at the forest only as a source of revenue or timber or game animals, it's a very significant concept. And uh, this huge expansion of protected areas, which takes place in 70s, 80s, a lot of that credit should go to Project Tiger, which was part of that range of uh, uh, initiatives. But uh, if you look at the literature of Project Tiger, I am very struck by how much of the legitimacy was agrarian. The tiger is seen as a keeper of the order in the forest. The forest is important for hydrological stability. And this is very, very significant. And this is also a time there is a lot of debate because of grassroots movements on big times destroying forests. So to me, I think that you know the tiger is, uh, is, is, is about itself. It's a very magnificent and fascinating animal. But it's also about India trying to carve out a certain place in the community of nations. Of course, all Indians were not unified on this. Uh, when you close one set of conflicts, you open up another. And I think over the last 50 years, we have seen the other sets of issues. What happens when you set out to conserve the tiger? Who are you saving it from and for what? Uh, who pays the cost? Who is the price exactly from? But it's still, I think, a very historic and important moment. And it's no coincidence, it's around this time, uh, between the early and late 70s, that various other tiger end states start moving on this. I mean, the Russians were protecting their tigers much before us. I do want to emphasize that. But you know, we are we were at a very historic moment around just around 50 years ago. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor. That was pretty um, you know enlightening as always. Uh, you talked about uh, tiger numbers. I remember reading somewhere that uh, this oft quoted figure of 40, we had 40,000 tigers at the time of independence, one lakh at the turn of 20th century. It was actually given by EPG. And when uh, I think Sankla asked him, ki, where did you get this number for? And you know, how do you calculate? He said, some number is better than nothing. And that is how this random figure of 1 lakh tigers and 40,000 tigers stuck. Um, I would like to now invite uh, Professor uh, Vijay. Um, he, you know, you have done some fascinating research, not just on hunting during colonial era, but also how it became a vehicle of colonialism in many ways, hunting as an exercise. Um, and, you know, again, this might be a you know, tall task because it's such a huge period and there are so many nuances and depths to your research. But if you could dwell on, you know, British attitudes towards the tiger as, as an animal and as, as Professor hinted at, as, as the symbol of, you know, uh, by killing it, you sort of establish your symbol of imperial dominance. And also how their policies during the uh, you know, colonial era and even individual action of hunters tied into this overarching, you know, political theme of, uh, you know, colonialism that defined that particular era. So if you could please, you know, enlighten us with your thoughts. Thank you, Raja. Uh, thanks for the organizers. Good evening, everyone. Uh, today, I'll speak a bit about, uh, uh, a little bit about beyond what the Professor Manish has said regarding the historical trajectory of the time. Uh, the women eradication, but the war against dangerous case that Mahesh had written about it, I trace it back to the days of the East India. Like, for example, uh, I was consulting some archives in the British Library in London, uh, which mentions about tiger bus referred as Vietnam, one for with like uh, any destructive animal. So during the East India, we had uh, elephants, troublesome elephants, wolves snakes, uh, any predatory animal, or even non-predatory animal. That was uh, threatening the uh, agrarian base, but also threatening the lives and livelihoods of people uh, were considered as well. So in that category came uh, tiger uh, as an official uh, women eradication policy uh, as early as 1822. Uh, for example, in Bengal presidency, uh, as many as 5,600 tigers were killed in one, one, in one year. This year, I'm referring to 1822. This is the document I got from British Library in London uh, when I was doing PhD at the University of Manchester. Uh, so, women eradication for sanitary respect to the DSO history. So, concerning the Ross, British Ross attitudes towards the tiger, it was a symbol of imperialism. Uh, a symbol of royal justice. But in my book, I argue that beyond what my has is it's also a uh, compulsion of the governments. 
this matter of you know expanding uh, British rule not only to the aggregating base but also onto the fringe territories. This is where uh, British found it necessary that we need to eliminate the tribes. So most of the records uh, we get from the 1820s onwards. I give one example of the uh, one uh, colonial official, Colonel uh, James Out. James Outram was the lieutenant commander of the East India Company when he was sent for a ill mission in the Western Farm, what is today's Gujarat, Pandesh and Kadiv of uh, His mission was uh, to expand uh, East India Company into the fringe territories in Western parts of India. Uh, but uh, British, British sent him as the commander of the East India Company troops. Uh, to subdue the bills, but he didn't uh, use military power. He used hunting, hunting of tigers in particular, uh, not with uh, you know high velocity rifles, but with bare hands. Uh, he befriended the bill community uh, in West Bengal. So how he befriended bills was in book I discuss was one of the colonial maneuver uh, to subjugate the people, but also to bring uh, this arable fringe land gates uh, under the direct orbit of the uh, East India Company. So James Autumn didn't kill anybody. He be oh. only by using Professor, Professor, if I, I'm very sorry to uh, interject. I think some of the listeners have just told me that uh, your voice is, mic is not very clear. So some of the words sort of get, um, you know, if, if you could. Uh, can you, get can you hear me? Can you hear me clearly now? Huh, yes. Now it is better. Yes, I, uh, okay. now my is better. my I think my volume is less now. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. So that's about James Outram. So people like James Outram, John Martha, these were the company officers used hunting of tigers uh, is a form of you know military exercise, but also indigenizing or acclimatizing themselves to the hot climate. So James Outram, in one instance, what happened is uh, the war against the Bills uh, uh, ended in disaster. Company troops have won against the Bills in the Western Foundation. But uh, 14 uh, European officers were killed, except James Outram. James Outram says that because I was killing tigers, in one instance, uh, he went in pursuit of a tiger uh, in one of the Foundation region uh, forests. Uh, he that tiger ran away after it got injured uh, from the knife of James Outram. James Outram didn't use rifle. Uh, it was uh, hiding in a cave. He pulled the tiger with his bare hands and uh, he took his hunting knife. He killed the tiger. That was a man eater. Uh, it was estimated to have killed around 26 people in the span of three years. So that man eating tiger was killed by James Outram just with bare hands to interest. So these were the Adivasi bills. Oh, yes, Professor. I think I think there is still some audio issues. Um, what what I'll do is I'll just come back to you on on this thought while you fix up your audio. Um, and I'll just get to uh, you know uh, Ranji Singh, Doctor Ranji Singh, till then. Um, and we'll we'll continue that train of thought. That very interesting discussion. Um, so uh, um, if I could, if I could. Um, Yes, and I think if 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 uh, um, Professor Ramdas, if your uh, uh, you know bandwidth is a little slow, then you can maybe switch off the video and then the audio becomes clear. If it is if it is an internet issue. Um, okay, can you can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, now 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 it's much better. So I'll I'll just come come back to you on this on this very interesting discussion, and I'll and I'll. I'll uh, I'll I'll get to uh, you know uh, Ranji Singh sir um, and uh, Dr. Ranji Singh. Um, if I could bring you in, um, you in many ways are uh, you know the living embodiment of India's post-independence shift from the era of um, hunting to the era of conservation. Especially since you saw the tumultuous period from the 60s onwards firsthand, um, you've been involved with the administrative side of things at the union level. With your you know incredible work behind the scenes in drafting the bedrock of all maybe conservation legislation in India, that is Wildlife Protection Act, as well as your work at the state level in Madhya Pradesh, undivided Madhya Pradesh, now Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, especially during your tenure as Forest Secretary MP, when you put together and I think this is a field that is unmatched and will remain unmatched. You put together 14 new wildlife sanctuaries, nine new national parks across 
erstwhile undivided MP and even double the area of the three existing national parks, two of which would be very familiar to the listeners, Tana and Bandhagar, you expanded their areas and Shivpuri, which lies in, uh, you know, um, in the northwest of uh, Madhya Pradesh. Moreover, with your own family background, you've had a very intimate knowledge of the hunting culture that prevailed in the princely state, many a times in tandem with the British and even, uh, you know, uh, at, at, there were uh, some princely states, Dungarpur, for example, could be one uh, that, that, you know, sowed the initial seeds of conservation in, you know, in, in the princely state region. And again, these themes, have, as, as all of our discussions, have a huge breadth. But if you could still try summarizing those crucial decades, especially from 1960s to, say, the late 1980s, when the seeds of conservation led by the government were sown and drawing on your own experiences both at the union level and your work in central India. And you could perhaps maybe try peppering in with the legacy of, you know, uh, princely states both during the Shikar as well as the conservation era. So I'll, I'll, I'll you know, please uh, take over, Professor uh, Dr. Ranjit Singh. Thank you very much, Dr. Raza. <clears throat> the, the transition period that you refer to uh, came, actually, the Holocaust, as I would like to call it, it took place from, say, 1948 to about 1960, 65. By that time, most of the, most of the animals and a lot of the wildlife habitat had gone. And the hunting era pre uh, prevailed. At the same time, there was a realization that this is totally unsustainable. There were shooting blocks, there was no wildlife legislation, there were only certain hunting restrictions under the Forest Act of 1927. Then, <clears throat> with that, they came to some extent. In India, um, we made that transition from a hunting era, as I would say, when tigers were meant to be shot and partridges were meant to be eaten. And a 10-foot tiger was a sort of a blue ribbon of, uh, of sport. And the greatest uh, uh, gift you could give to a guest was to, 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 to get him a tiger. And there was this wine amongst the princes and amongst the uh, British uh, governors to get the Viceroy and the governors and the political agents a 10-foot tiger. And the Gwalior family went still further and tried to get the Viceroy the, the world record tiger. And then you went into 11 feet and all that, but I won't go into all that. So it was a kind of a, a Nazrana or a kind of a gift. And in India, I believe that there are no halfway houses. Either you allow hunting or you close it. And that you can see even in a national park or a sanctuary or elsewhere. If you stop everything, everything recovers. If you allow partial usage, we know what happens. Now, <clears throat> so that transition had to be brought about. But one required political support. To my mind, the most important concomitant of, to conservation, either in an autocracy or in a democracy, is political support in a developing country like ours. Because unlike any other country, conservation has always come from the top. It's, it's a paradox. Instead of from down below, though we are a vegetarian country, though we are, by and large, a very law-abiding country, and we have a great empathy for life and nature. But yet, it has always come from the top. Anyway, mm. so while I was trying to do what I can in Tana, but that was as a collector, and there were others who were doing their own bit elsewhere, there was no unified kind of an approach. And the tigers were going, the forest was going, the wildlife per se was going. The tiger was one, one, uh, one flagship, as it were, uh, to represent what was lost. But, uh, I mean, we, we mentioned about the 
the loss of tigers, and rightly so. But my estimation is that in 10 years, the black buck population of my own area of Saurashtra came down from about 85 to 90,000 to less than 2,000 in 10 years. That, that was the kind of decline. And that was the kind of, it was a, a change in the era, the change in a milieu, change in priorities, and change of, um, should I say, ethics of sport or ethics or whatever, you know, of, uh, of conservation. Anyway, as rightly pointed out, that transition was taking place. There were EPG was there, Dr. Salim Ali was there, and there were others too. And there, luckily, we had a prime minister who was interested. And it was because of her support to, that, to a very large extent that one was able to, uh, you know, when I suggested this idea to her that there should be a national day. She called a meeting, I remember, in September 1971 uh, to, to, to say what could be done about nature conservation. And, and uh, this was just after the IUCN conference, which was the first exposure. And it was there that Project Tiger was moved when, when Dylan Ripley of um, America, representing her, uh, said that, and NWW said they could uh, contribute a million dollars to what they called Operation Tiger. But lucky, uh, rightly so, in India, we changed the title to Project Tiger. And, and uh, with that came a sort of idea that foreigners are keen to help us and we should wake up. And a lot of people, Billy Arjun Singh and so many others, spoke out at that meeting in the IUCN conference. And to me, that was the turning point. Turning point in India's thing, I think that was the best wildlife conference I ever attended, the IUCN meeting in 1969 in, in Delhi. And that was the first briefing of Mrs. Gandhi. But she, she was, didn't have the direction as yet. And then in that meeting in 72, when she had seen my wildlife movies and she, she called a number of people and, and they all said it's a state subject and we can't legislate on that state, so we can't do anything. And, and uh, but we are telling, we are doing our best. Dr. Karim Singh was there, the IG Forest was there. There were others. Kailash, Kailash Sankla was also very much there. Then, uh, then, uh, I came my turn to speak. I said, Madam, it's not so hopeless. I think we as a center can legislate on a, uh, on a state subject provided two states under Article 248 trade with Article 250 of the Constitution can legislate on, on a state subject provided two Income states uh, provided two states uh, can and, and, and would uh, empower the government of India to legislate on a state subject, then it will apply to those states and those who subsequently adopt that particular act. Dr. Karan Singh said, spoke out, I remember, which state will give us our powers? And she turns to him and eyes him and says, I will write to the states. And she did. She wrote to all the states, and it's a letter worth reading, in which she said, this is a non-political subject and I would like you to do it. And would you believe it? Before I finished drafting the Wildlife Protection Act, and before it was even cleared, 18 states, including one non-Congress state, had passed that legislation. They didn't even know what the legislation was. That won't happen now. But that was the kind of thing. Because the impetus was there from the boss, as it were, as it was in princely area in the British era. And that's, as I said, is a bit of a paradox. And with that, and with that support, came the act. And <clears throat> throughout, and then Project Tiger. Project Tiger came uh, the next year, in 73, but uh, launched in 73. But in 72, I was put in charge as the uh, member secretary of the steering committee which started Project Tiger, the, the initial stage. And I would like to mention here, uh, and that's of significance that we did not select the best areas for tiger only. 
we selected representative areas to represent the tiger's habitat and those areas which could be upgraded under the ages of the project as it were and secondly those which had the, the largest number of endangered species and had a quality of its own okay therefore to give one example we did not select kaziranga because we had choice of only one we selected manas manas at that, that time had 28 species under schedule one one the largest of any national park kaziranga was already looked after because uh, because of the of the rhinoceros and therefore that came about and that transition took place and mrs gandhi then intervened and prevent and, and stop the hunting of tigers by saying until the legislation came about you couldn't but before even the legislation she she took it up with the state government and the foreign tours uh, were stopped irrespective of the fact that one central cabinet minister had his own personal interests in uh, in a safari where they used to entertain foreigners uh, who used to come and shoot here so that is how it started and then of course thereafter but i have gone on too long no no uh, that is you you're, you're so eloquent that uh, you know it is very difficult to sort of uh, you don't even realize how much time has passed as a, as a listener um you very kindly referred to me as a doctor but sir i'm i'm no doctor full disclosure i am the least qualified person on this panel <laughs> but uh, um you talked about manas and and you know I, I i think the cabinet minister you were suggesting was vc shukla because vc shukla had a shikar company called alvin and cooper and uh, you know he he was sort of the uncrowned prince of shikar hunting companies and you know shikar hunting in india and a very powerful minister with with his father being the chief minister of uh, central provinces as it was so i mean yeah it, it was quite remarkable that indira gandhi sort of you know intervened and took on not just you know her her political opponents to get them rally them on on this common around this common cause but even also you know uh, she took on her own cabinet people um you've to- mentioned manas and manas is in assam for those of you who might not know and that brings me to our next speaker um you know uh, dr sonali ghosh she's uh, i'll i'll bring you in uh, dr sonali and my sort of question to you is that um the forest department especially ifs officers if you know we have talked about the in in general terms about the colonial history but ifs officers in particular um, have played a very very you know very role in this entire story of tiger conservation or shikar as it were uh, during the colonial era of the imperial forest service as it was called back then um, you know most forest officers were you would call them administrative enablers for the colonial policies related to forest extraction silviculture and managing dangerous wild beasts as they called them back then while at the same time it is again you know the word that has been repeated uh, by uh, ranjit singh sir that it, in a paradox even some of the earliest conservationists of india were ifs officers you know if i and you know who were who, were, who first spoke up about the decline of wildlife in india and you know the the names that randomly come to my mind are you know people like fw champion f canning es nidhis in united provinces there was dunbar brander who wrote about the decline in wildlife in central provinces i think i there's this very famous line by him that uh, you know if you in in during his hey days if you walk the banger valley which is now uh, kanha national park he said that he could count as many heads of herbivores as he had seen in the best of african you know landscapes in you know savanna landscape so he put in his word you know there was eo shaber in bengal aj w milroy in assam uh, there was a wimbush in madras and so on there are quite a few names and in the post independence era when it came to you know the indians taking over the reins of conservation in india there were a lot of forest officers who uh, you know some of them ranjit singh sir has already mentioned and uh, you know they came uh, they, they played a very key role kela sankla sr chaudhary in odisha sp shah in bihar sanjay debroy who you would know sort of his work well pd shreshi who sort of was a senior to all these gentlemen but from assam he was uh, one of the early proponents of conservation of wildlife 
so it would be wonderful to have your reflections on the changing role of forest officers through history and then of course your own experiences in managing key protected areas and forests of assam so if i could you know bring you in please thank you uh yeah thank you there so much raza am i audible yeah okay yes yeah absolutely yeah. okay uh no so thank you so much and uh, first of all it is indeed an honor for me to be part of this august gathering uh, especially to share the forum with luminaries you know who have written the act that we implement uh, and papers and books of, uh, you know the experts so we have drawn up reading and also cherish so thank you so much there i will limit my opinion ex experience to largely working as a site manager as you said in assam and you know how uh, i feel that over the last 23 years that i have been now in the service how we have been able to you know evolve and 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 i think i'm a little hopeful and happy to kind of uh come here today that you know when i look back at conservation in assam uh in the last 200 years i i feel happy to understand now that it has always been uh people centric or community centric which we now feel that as forest officers we need to do and and i will uh, want to give examples of how, why i feel that way so so when we look at the demarcation of state owned forests expansion of tea and agrarian based economies continuation of community conserved areas you know beliefs and customs and values especially in the context of northeast they have all gone hand in hand and and then among all of this of course has been the ray of hope of conservation of large mammals uh, which of course uh, includes the greater one horned rhino the asiatic elephant tigers and so on and 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 many of my the previous speakers have already said you have also said uh, in in your uh, talk that it is basically uh, there are great luminaries of forest officers of course uh, in uh, starting with pd stracy who seminal work on the uh, elephant behavior and the elephant goal still remains uh, one of the best books uh, for the country uh, we also have of course as you said uh, ajw minroy then and our own homegrown uh, forest officers like mahi chandra miri uh, who was a missing tribal uh, assistant conservator of forest and who kind of uh, started the patrolling the on foot patrolling systems that we see uh strengthened in kaziranga and practiced everywhere else uh we did have mr prabhakar borwa the first native uh, head of the forest department of andavad in assam and it is worth mentioning that well assam used to also have some of the largest uh, reserved forests uh, of south asia you know largely systematically converted to promote timber yielding species the sal forest primarily during the colonial re regime and large mammals were of course largely considered as big game so to come up with a dedicated uh, support for large mammal conservation and setting aside protected areas was a big step in this direction and post independence the game sanctuaries the private hunting grounds and some of the community protected sites came into the realm of state department functioning and it was at this crucial juncture that governance structures were rebuilt brick by brick and with localized uh, specializations and uh, to name a few officials in the post independence era we had pn lahon who worked systematically to survey demarcate wildlife areas dp neo who strengthened the infrastructure such as wireless systems roads buildings and so on sanjay devroy as you mentioned rightly took up initiatives to strengthen surveillance and also took up science based uh, management initiatives so effectively for me as a forest officer working in these landscapes there are key three key learnings from the assam model of wildlife and tiger conservation uh, one is of course that the community centric conservation approach uh, and it is always been uh, you know this is these are the sites especially northeast india where even a kid can say that wildlife stays in my backyard you know that is the kind of uh, uh, affinity we have and there is an intrinsic born between nature which emanates from living and growing up uh, with 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 the animals the wildlife in modern times it can work both ways it can either help to protect and strengthen the conservation or to deplete uh, the natural resource and hence there is a need for the art to reinstate this whole nature culture relationship 
uh, and tradition as part of our management and governance interventions. Uh, this whole regime of going down to the brass tacks, basically the field patrolling, walking the forest, uh, to strengthen the human resource at the forest frontline level has helped secure places such as Kaziranga. And now this also forms the basis of several of our modern technology-based interventions, be it end stripes, smart patrolling, and so on. But they all kind of emanate from this food-based patrolling method and, and keeping uh, you know, a certain area designated for a systematic monitoring. And, and this has been extremely effective, especially when you're looking at areas with high sensitivity to poaching, illicit felling, armed conflict, and so on. And uh, of course, we have the, uh, the third lesson is uh, what is the science-based wildlife management or strengthening the goalpost by focusing not just on the tiger, but on other apex species. So for example, the Manus revival story uh, and reintroducing the one-horned rhino into it, uh, overseeing the dedicated ex situ population revival plan for pygmy hawk. Uh, which is found nowhere else in the world except for a few protected areas uh, in, in the state. Uh, then community, strengthening the community protection of endemic species such as golden langur, pula gibbon, gangetic dolphins, Bengal florican. Uh, the research which is done uh, in terms of understanding their requirements and many of these science-backed management interventions that have helped uh, or they kind of continue to emphasize on the kind of habitat that can be protected. So, so in my opinion, um, it, it has been great in terms of uh, the SR model and uh, yeah, and we can talk about it even more. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, uh, Sonali ma'am. And I think Dr. Ranjit Singh wants to come in. Yes. Yes, yes please, please, please. Uh, thank you, Reza. I just want to pay my homage to the forest officers whose name um, Sonali Ji was not able to because it's a very long list to add to them. And there is one factor there, I'll be very quick. <clears throat> um, amongst the British and of course Dunbar Brander and, and I think it's P.T. Stracy and my friend uh, uh, Lahan. <clears throat> there was also, <clears throat> there were a number of others. <clears throat> there was S.P. Shahi of, uh, of Orissa. There was Sanjay uh, Debroy. And and uh, Pawar, of course, Sakla, Saroj Raj Chaudhary. He was a one of a kind. And what uh, that man did, and he was started the first training school. And he forgo, he, he, he let go his promotion in order to contribute to this. That's saying a lot for a bureaucrat. But to, you see, in the princely era, we used to have when the Maharaja or the or the British used to say, my tigers, my Barasinga, my Samba, it was a personal commitment. When a park director started calling his park, my park, when, when I used to call uh, Kana my park, and Pawar used to call it his park, that made the difference. Mirai. That personal commitment and that came. I'll add one very quick thing about the personal commitment of Sanjay Debroy. He was dying of cancer two days before the, and I went to see him for the last time in uh, All India Medical Institute, I think, and they told me he's asking for the waters of Beki. Beki. <clears throat> they said, What is Beki? I said, I know where Beki is. When the Matanguri, uh, the Manas bifurcates, one is the mainstream, the other is the Beki. And he and I have done many, and he used to go and fish there also, Sanjoy. He was asking for the water of his park before he died. I was in charge of the project. Um, tag. I phoned that very night, go and get the water of Beki. He said, so it's a monsoon, we can't cross. I said, do what you can. Cross the thing. And I'll pay for the water to come. They crossed on the stream. Despite the floods, they brought the water. It arrived in the morning. That night, Sanjay had died. And I poured the water down his body's throat. But that was the commitment. 
that that that, that was pretty uh, you know emotional uh, doctor and you think uh, professor rangrajan wants to have a word please professor please uh, professor you need to uh, unmute i think yeah just just two things i mean one i think we should keep in mind the context of 70s 80s politically was very different because the nature of the economy was very different you know dr ranjit singh pointed out how prime minister could write to the chief ministers and they would agree it is true in 72 mrs gandhi's party controlled virtually all the states my home state tamil nadu is one exception uh, now that is not the situation however powerful one political party is it is unlikely it will be in power in all the 28 states even if it were in power states are very assert and this is true even in mrs gandhi's time we know there were attempts to take over anthapur sariska dr salim ali wanted central control it was not possible and related to this is the fact that you know uh, the nature of the economy changing the threat to forest if you look at the 60s 70s debate seems to be from the expansion of agriculture and extraction of biomass these are the two main issues but something which may not have loomed that large then is what one would call the extractive economy minerals iron ore coal gas oil and the transport linkages the road rail and so on and uh, so the kind of uh, setting aside areas which may have been conceived of then you can see today that some of those very areas there is a major drive to bisect them or trisect them precisely with these extractive projects and honestly the support for these projects in the mass of population may be more than the opposition this is something one has to come to terms with it's not easy if you are uh, someone looking at long term ecological security but the other dimension and i i mean i have to say this i'm strong of history is that you know the forest space was never decolonized the way the agricultural space was in agriculture from 50s we had zamindari abolition and land reform in all the states we are in if you look at land holding you know if you see old hindi films the bad guy is the thakur and you know dharmendra or somebody challenges him but that has that has vanished today and the, the one of the positive aspects of democracy is that over time the awareness of rights grows so one of the governments which did a lot for land rights was left front government of west bengal but in 1970 morijappi people who had been settled by the government i want to emphasize who resisted being moved out they many of them were killed in a fire it's a well known incident it's been written about by anu jalai and i think there's some attempt at cost correction in the 2000s uh, particularly on land rights through the forest rights act i am aware this is deeply controversial people are asked are you for the tiger or the tribe you know we are in a television era now you have to say a or b now as far as land rights are concerned one of the issues is that land rights aside tenurial rights issues were never quite settled in forests uh, after independence and much of the debate was about the forest it was not about land for cultivation and those issues are still festering so the picture is a very different one today from early 70s i do want to add uh, in 72 73 mrs gandhi's legitimacy it went away after some and one of the reasons for legitimacy i'm drawing on someone people may be surprised dr ullas karat where he wrote a very nice article in 2000 where he said that in the popular mind there was a parallel between the safari operator and the smuggler of the endangered species skins and the black marketer and hoarder you know at that time black marketer hoarder was a very important symbol there was even a film roti kapda aur makan by manoj kumar so i think we are living in a very different kind of political context there are now 3 million elected panchayat representatives there are gram sabhas i am not suggesting one is bad one is good but the entire context has changed it's very difficult to see a leader even a chief minister exercising that kind of power and even if they were to exercise the power this extractive economy is today very powerful at every level of society so the larger environmental question is there for everybody whether one looks at it with tribal rights angle or the tiger angle and one has to reconcile because to my mind you cannot have a stable uh, tiger population in the long run and forest unless the larger number of people are with it at the same time the biology has to be taken into account so thanks that was very enlightening and i think we have uh, give a lot to unpack that has been discussed um you know and uh, you know just my quick few comments were that what uh, dr sonali spoke about you know the food patrolling 
that that being so important and i remember this was an old and and this is something that especially foot patrolling by forest officers ifs officers leading from the front and this was something that that has sort of declined perhaps in the in the current age uh, of you know and and it has its both you know science has developed and all of those things but there used to be an old adage where you know uh, people used to say that back in the day that the best manure for a forest is a ifs officer or a forest officer's boots so you know that 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 was sort of the attitude and i think you're very right that maybe we need to uh, think about you know reviving those traditions and um professor rangrajan has spoken very i, I remember dr ranjit singh reading about this uh, devroy sahab story um but i think it is much more emotional to listen to it in person i remember it was in your book indian wildlife as well um and uh, as professor rangrajan has very rightly pointed out that this uh, you know this this conflict between uh, what today's political and economic realities are and you know this is as as the democratization occurs people get more uh, you know uh, conscious of their rights rightly so and with that you know come challenges for for all the parties involved and uh, you know in in terms of tiger conservation you know as as he rightly rightly pointed out the forest rights act has a lot of divided opinion among especially among wildlifers but but it is a reality and this is something that needs to be engaged with and uh, again with the extractive industries and that sort of rounds off to what i was thinking that uh, a lot of time what we see uh, lacking perhaps in the current age is Uh, especially perhaps among the managers is and this could also be because now managers tend to get very short tenures in particular paths earlier you could have a dfo spending 15 years 12 years 14 years in a park and developing that that affinity of ye mera park hai this is my park as ranjit singh said this this personal bond which is sort of perhaps lacking today and that sort of also uh, reflects in in the kind of clearances that the quick clearances that we sometimes get from the for for the extractive users because perhaps even among the managers that sense of ownership towards the forest is lacking which sort of makes things easier for for the industry in some way anyway i i i won't sort of uh, you know drone on with my thoughts um i think uh, both uh, professor rangrajan and uh, dr ranjit singh have covered a lot of ground of, of what i was going to ask you know in the coming questions but uh, just you know i'll i'll uh, with i'll i'll just go back to dr ranjit singh and you know talking just of uh, central provinces or i mean uh, you know madhya pradesh as it was uh, you have worked with some very fascinating ifs officers as well you know you pointed out hs pawar sahab's name there was there is uh, touchwood jj datta sahab who is in his late 90s and he was sort of one of the pioneers of conservation in uh, madhya pradesh um so uh, you know um, and and both you and uh, dr sonali mahesh all of have talked about the role of institutions um so i get because you have been part of government institutions i'll i would like to get your thoughts on this uh, what what the present day conflict uh, you know the kind of conflict that mahesh has you know professor rangrajan has spoken about um uh, around parks you know this uh, between forest managers and government institutions on one side and people standing on the other way this they want their rights to be recognized there is lots of conflict even related to conservation um what is the role of government institutions in this regard especially because a lot of these conflicts have their roots in the conservation era legislation that came you know in the 70s and the 80s so i'll i'll, I'll just open the floor with with that thought please this is the most crucial question which will decide the future of indian conservation uh in view of the fact that we are a democracy and a vibrant one and the government is interested in the votes of the people and rightly so and the opinion of the people so where does populism end and governance start the the dilemma which uh, mahesh mentioned briefly about um, the biological uh, imperatives the ecological the conservation imperative and the local needs of the people the basic needs of the people the that is the uh, our parks and we all know this are islands surrounded by humanity they are small the connectivities have been lost very difficult to restore so they are suffering from the same 
what we call the island syndrome. Now, around them are people who were previously cowed down about. They can't be, and they shouldn't be. And you cannot conserve uh, nature, or cannot conserve anything of wildlife through the barrels of the gun, as it were called. Now, <clears throat> so how do you win the support of the local people? How do you ask them to overlook uh, the fact that a cow has been killed or is a uh, field, uh, the only source of substance has been trampled to smithereens by some elephant. So uh, it, it has to come in a number of ways. The, and the conflict will always be there because, because uh, the surplus population of carnivores, herbivores will go out. And how do you, one of the, uh, the ways would have been to some extent um, establish a corridor and some extent to change the cropping pattern. But it's easier said than done. It's not been tried despite whatever one may have tried. And, okay. To sort of make the crops outside less attractive. To see that they have the prey bases built up. You see, we have not been able to, be, we only talk about tigers. We don't talk about the prey base. I remember going first to the Corbett National Park and seeing more, more uh, hog deer there than cheetah. It's difficult to believe now. But this was true in 1981, 82. Now, there are less than a dozen hog deer left. And nobody's bothered. It's only the tiger. And we have lost sight of the prey base. If you build up the prey base, you can, to that extent, reduce the conflict. If you increase the carrying capacity, as it were, of the, whether it's exotic control, biological, whether it is enhancing the productivity of the place by proper management and not by some, uh, uh, you know, exotic intervention, then you could increase to that extent. But one very important concomitant is compensation. I started the cattle compensation scheme whereby certain areas you were, the cattle was not allowed to graze and if they were killed there, no compensation parks and sanctuaries. If the, if the tiger went out and killed where uh, grazing was allowed, they should be given full compensation. But that doesn't happen. It takes months and they don't get compensation. But on the other hand, as Project Tiger, uh, this I think I'd started a scheme which works very well. They have Corbett Foundation from financial support around Corbett and uh, has uh, Corbett alone since the, the last 25 years, 24 years, has compensated 16,000 plus livestock kills, not a single animal killed. You go there, you do a panchanama, you pay on the spot. But that doesn't happen. And unfortunately, there are kickbacks involved too. So why do you worry? You poison the animal. So that kind of a thing. And that's application. The scheme is there, the project, the, the, the fund, but it's, the, it's, it's the, the delivery of it. If those things were done, I think to that extent, it would reduce the thing. The other is to develop a stake, whether it's tourism or a thing. And there is a third, a very important factor which we must take advantage of in India, the religious sentiment. There is, and I've written a chapter in my first book, Religious Sentiment and Wildlife, and there are communities all over the country who are very keen to conserve nature despite all. And let me say this, last thing. When I first counted, there was a belief that there were a hundred, and I also felt when I first went to Manipur, locked out Kaibul Ramja, that there were about 50 Sangai left in the world. When I counted them for the first time from a helicopter, there were 14 animals, the rarest taxa in the whole world, 14 animals, stag, hind and fawn, six and a half square kilometers. And I go the next day and tell the local people, please don't, please don't graze your cattle there. It's the only place in the world for your sangai. And the reply was, it's the only place in the world for us to graze our cattle. What, what answer could I give them? But 10 years later, then, one took it up, it became a national park. I involved Mrs. Gandhi again, and she wrote 
and it became we we tried and i proposed it became a state anu and the manipur uh, dance school took it on and made it into a dancing deer epg's terminology and now the biggest thing in thing is the sangai the biggest festival in manipur is the sangai it <laughs> the uh, the big uh, the largest circulated english newspaper is sangai times and when i went last time they came to see me in turachanpur you going next day sir we know what you done for this but don't go low don't do this the sangai they'll sink into the sea i asked how many ngos are there for the sangai and they said over 100 sangai has been taken over as a symbol the people of manipur will not allow its extinction i have written a chapter also on this the tale of two whales and two deer the whale of kashmir the whale of manipur there it become an idol an icon unfortunately in, in kashmir the state animal again is again but still a succulent piece of flesh on hoof living meat that's the difference we have not been able to sell the and to make convince the people and that's why media education everything comes in that was such a remarkable thought uh, and you know uh, i i think the the, the point about you know the, the sense of ownership that is lacking and i think that is something that is critical uh, across landscapes i mean and and the other very important point that you raised that before the tigers uh, there 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 is a need to worry about the prey base as well because um, in some of our areas i mean when i say our areas i mean the the areas i hail from jharkhand odisha chatisgarh telangana this area it was the prey base actually that went extinct first the tigers actually followed much later yes. um so 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 that is very important i think uh professor uh, vijay has been waiting uh, for a very long time so and since we are talking of indigenous communities um i would like to bring him in because one of the aspects of you know conservation shikarishi is that we often tend to overlook the history of the people of the indigenous people who lived in the landscapes and were perhaps the most impacted by the policies of the colonial government or even the post independent government and a lot of uh, professor vijay's work has been uh, you know the experience of indigenous communities during the colonial shikar era and thereafter bagas gon especially um and so i i wanted you know uh, to bring you in uh, professor vijay to give us a sense of uh, you know what would be your summarizing of you know the most important takeaways uh, from your study of the history of indigenous people in in these landscapes during this uh, period of colonial era and thereafter please oh, uh, somebody from the team needs to unmute uh, professor vijay um, can you hear me rajan yes yes yeah, you're audible now please please go yeah okay thanks for the panel i think yeah, especially from my ifs officers is very fascinating because uh, when i was writing shooting a tiger book i discuss a lot about uh, british uh, uh, that uh, indian forest service was established in 1864 uh, i give the example of james forsyth uh, he was one of the forest officer worked in the central provinces division um, and they were advocating that the whole concept of preservation and conservation came from 1870s uh, onwards because of the establishment of the imperial forest department which later became now indian forest service uh, so conservation actually started as early as 1870s but tiger were uh, tigers were not listed uh, under uh, you know protected species one animal was uh, you know listed under protected species that is an elephant the indian elephant was began to be protected from 1864 onwards then there was the passing of the elephant preservation act by uh, madras presidency government in 1873 which paved the way for the all india conservation efforts towards elephants why elephant was protected but not the tiger tiger continued to be listed as well um, uh, until 18 uh, until 1920s until the famous uh, hunter town conservationist jim corbett came to the fore so what you know some of the 
uh, uh, Mr. N.K. Ranjit Singh, the, the officer, was telling about how he was looking into the, you know, uh, negotiating with the local people, uh, tapping on uh, their cooperation towards protecting the tiger species. Jim Corbett was rallying uh, to the colonial government that tigers must be protected. So he loved tigers. You now, why tigers should be protected? The dog, what was the argument of Jim Corbett, whole philosophy of conservation? Because these were magnificent species, like Mahesh Rangarajan pointed out, but also India needs them. So now we lost them so much during colonial times, thousands of them were destroyed. Uh, now the um, possible uh, uh, possible uh, prognosis for the tiger conservation would be increasing of the tiger corridors. Uh, but also it's wrong. I think I think after listening to the panel, what Professor Mahesh was saying and uh, uh, Sonali Ghosh and uh, Ranjit Sindhi was saying that uh, this protection of the tigers need uh, you know prey also one has to think about what was tiger spray why they are staying out of the uh, particular uh, forest uh, cover because they need more space so habitat increase one solution but the government of india is thinking i don't know the state governments are thinking i have no idea but it's definitely forest officers were thinking because they were on the ground they are on the grassroots level so in my book, uh, not necessarily shooting a tiger, I have written about uh, India's Adivasi tribes, such as Gons and Baikos in the central provinces. They had very, you know, uh, they know how to coexist with tigers. British came, they destroyed tigers in the name of governance, in the name of revenue expansion, in the name of, you know, development works, including railways. Introduction of railway, Indian railway system from 1860s on boards brought colonial government uh, to hunt tigers viciously. Hence, that was the main reason. British were like, you know, a, like a mercantile enterprise uh, when they came and ruled India. So tiger did not figure out until Jim Corbett came to the fore. But in post-colonial scenario, I would suggest that increasing of the habitat of tigers would be a good idea. But I don't know, IFS officers only have the grassroots knowledge, but whether they could convince the commissions or the government or the state politicians uh, to increase uh, this forest cover. Uh, along with tigers, we need habitat cover, other kinds of prey, like nilagai, wild boar. Like uh, at University of Hyderabad, we have around 2,005 acres of the forest cover is in the midst of Hyderabad city. And we, we have around 9,200 deer, deer species, 40 deer. We don't have tigers on the campus, is about uh, around 7,000 students. Uh, but it's, it's sir, uh, I, I'm so sorry, this is such an interesting conversation, but I sort of, you know, I'm getting constant messages from the moderators. We are running out of time. Um, you know, just for the audience, I, I, I just need to tell them that we might go slightly, uh, you know, more than the scheduled time. And, uh, you know, I, I hope you can bear with us, but, you know, when you have so many, you know, such such distinguished luminaries, it, it sort of, it, it often happens. Uh, because picking up on what, uh, uh, you know, uh, Professor Amdas was talking about, uh, the Gons and the Begas and, you know, sent, because we are sort of, we have straddled from Assam to Central India and now we are in Central India. Um, one of the things that I wanted to bring in, uh, you know, Professor Rangarajan in, and uh, for those of you who don't know, his first book, Fencing the Forest, was basically based on, you know, uh, his studies into the histories of both people and uh, colonial forest policies in Central India. Um, so uh, I wanted to understand the role of, uh, you know, and uh, from Professor Rangarajan of, of, you know, the the institutions, colonial institutions in sort of creating this this in what, what some would argue is this modern day divide between, you know, tribal rights on one hand and, and you know, needs of conservation, so to speak, on the other. Um, so, so I would like you to please bring in a historical perspective on that. So, you know, you quoted uh, Dunbar Brander and uh, many people who have read Dunbar Brander, this may sound heresy, uh, rate him as, uh, as fine a naturalist as Jim Cockett. And uh, Dunbar Brander would have spent much of his time on the ground, except in the monsoon, he would have been out in the field. Dunbar Brander is a very interesting generation because he managed to get access to a fossil fuel driven transport. In the early part, he would have gone on horseback. In fact, he hunted a swamp deer. He tried to spear swamp deer on Maidan of the 
uh, what is now Kanha Park, the Banjar Valley. But you know, the, the, the forest officer was not just controlling the forest in terms of timber. They were working the forest. And uh, it's important in area like uh, Central India, today's Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh. This is true of very large parts of East Central India, as are probably familiar with. Uh, the forest uh, had very large numbers of people both within and around it. So the real uh, dilemma for British was to demarcate the forest. And uh, there's a very great scholar now dead, Michael Williams, who said it's a crowning administrative achievement of British in India to have, you know, almost uh, 580,000 square kilometers of forest. Uh, they did it initially for standing timber for the railways. But very soon it becomes much more than that. They are trying to extract revenue for land. They are handing out uh, uh, grazing permits. In many areas, they settle forest villages, which do not have tenurial rights. They're supposed to be free labor. The free labor is begar, it's forced labor. And the other side, I want to emphasize, in uh, many parts of central India, uh, there was a lot of resistance to the forest department. One of them, which has been hinted at by people, you know, the crop protection guns, it was very difficult to get. And while the government programs were to eliminate the carnivores, the major problem people had was with herbivores particularly wild boar, nilgai, samba, cheetal, that they were uh, raiding the crops. So there is this very major tension. Are these sporting animals to be protected for sport? Or are they animals which are damaging the crops? So somebody has asked a very good question. Is the person who protects crops a criminal? Of course not. But what defense do you give for the animal? Because it also needs a defense. So I think this, this idea that the deer and the boars belong to the sarkar, Whereas the Khet and the Anaj belongs to the Kisan, it's very clear here there are counterparts in, in Prince Street. The other dimension, of course, is that foresters were very powerful at that time because until 1920s and 30s, you did not have elected representatives. So you first have ministers in India only under 1937. And uh, that's very interesting the anti the resistance to forest laws in 1929 30, civil disobedience movement in Central provinces. One of the leaders is D.P. Mishra. Other is uh, uh, Ravi Shankar Shukla, who later became chief minister, administering the same forest departments. And you know, it was a symbolic act where Gandhiji said, "Where there is no salt, you cannot make salt. Salt much, dandi much." He said, "You violate the forest law." So D.P. Mishra, Ravi Shankar Shukla went with a lot of bales and gones into the forest. They wanted to chop a few trees and do symbolic protest in Bombay. Many of the bills said, no, no, it's not symbolic. We are chopping the trees and taking over the forest. So, you know, much of this dilemma is already present in the British. And there is no doubt, and I want to quote Michael Williams' other line, and I'll end there, is that the same system, which was such an administrative achievement, left a festering sore in the countryside. And it's not a coincidence. Many British officers, you know, many of them were very well read in history. And in the file notes, keep with notes, they write, oh, I feel very guilty. Are we doing to the people in the forest what the Normans did when they conquered the Anglo-Saxons? You know, many people here may remember Robin Hood. He fought against the evil sheriff by poaching deer. So there is that very sharp divide which comes. And I do think there have been a lot of changes in independent India, but I'm sure we'll all agree that it's not a coincidence that the hill areas, forest areas, Adivasis, other such communities, not only Adivasis, they have benefited the least from development. And the the forest or the forest department, because it's a control of land, I think this is very crucial. It's not the forest today, it's the land which is under, under conflict. And I want to emphasize today, the kind of pace of extractive interests which are coming is very real. It's very real across the world. But in India, in the last 20 years, it has really gathered force. I don't think it was there in quite the sense in that period, though the coal mines are not did open up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. That was, I mean, I always run out of words when I hear you, sort of. So I'll, I'll, I'll not speak too much. Uh, since we've been talking so much about the uh, past, uh, you know, and, and also the problems that brought with it, maybe it is fair that we also talk about possible solutions. And this is where I would want, you know, um, Dr. Sonali to come in. And uh, as someone who has been sort of, you know, uh, serving... Uh, member of an institution tasked with tiger conservation among other responsibilities and your work over the years has equipped you with an intimate knowledge of Assam uh, where conservation is especially challenging I would say perhaps because due to the political and ethnic fault lines that are rooted in the past 
very similar to what happens in our landscape that is when i say our jharkhand chatisgarh odisha these area east central india so i find the case of manas for example uh, very interesting because it has multiple arcs that are sort of fault line arcs that meet uh, that that are representative of northeast in general you know there was a manas was a forest that was once a hunting ground of the royalties that it comes under protected under project tiger and it does especially well as uh, especially under you know uh, debrai saab who was uh, the field director for a very long time then the historic ethnic and managerial tensions that had always existed in that entire landscape they sort of boil over the bodo sort of you know revolt in in some ways an insurgency is born and you know one of the primary targets of that insurgency for various reasons then you know that is another separate subject is sort of wildlife of that area rampant hunting occurs the forest department is driven out of the park uh, local extinctions of rhinos and swamp there happen tigers are nearly wiped out and then you know after decades of conflict peace eventually returns with the bodo accord of 2003 and we see that very interestingly and perhaps it is one of the only such models in all of india that manas today is managed both by the forest department as well as the community driven management under the aegis of bodo territorial bodo land territorial council that was established as part of the accord um, and now we see that in the recent years wildlife has again started you know floundering in in uh, manas i see fascinating photos of you know melanistic leopards and tigers and you know the rhinos that you mentioned have been re- reintroduced in that area so you know drawing upon this why do you think that only a handful of pas in assam when i say pa protected areas in assam and other northeast states have worked when it comes to tiger conservation and most of the other areas have failed and do you think that a manas sort of model of conservation could be tried out in other parts of northeast india uh, assam as well as other states which have almost lost all their tigers and even you know even it could be uh, replicated in mainland india but yeah your thoughts on that yeah no thank you rasa and uh, i think you've you've answered the question yourself in the way you beautifully described the manas narrative you know in in uh, in a few sentences and i firmly believe and and this is again you know what you've said the manas model what i see is is the multiple governance models that we are talking about and 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 i'm very very uh, kind of now with, with, with a bit of experience in the field i feel that we cannot have a one size fits all kind of policies especially when we are looking at northeast and and multiple governance systems are accepted world over there is this classic uh, iuc and protected area governance topologies uh, of four different type of governance models that they give which i think even holds now and what manas saw was this evolution of you know how the governance structures worked within and outside so so that is something which we would be number one ready to accept and then you know implement uh, so that that would perhaps help especially in complex situations like we have in northeast the other is understanding and respecting this whole aspect of ecology and biology you know there is enough evidence to say that tropical areas tropical forested areas of northeast would anyway do not have the kind of tiger densities that we are talking about in the rest of the indian subcontinent so so does it mean that they are bad no they are probably good but we are probably looking at the wrong lens of looking at these protected areas what we need what dr ranjit singh was saying about prey base the lesser cats uh, the other valuable species that and we need to have some sort of management and conservation strategies which would protect those and then i i would say that the health of the ecosystems would be at par with what we say about tiger reserves and tiger landscapes across thank you thank you so much uh, dr sonali so i think uh, you know i'm getting constant messages from my you know from the team at the back end saying we are running out of time so uh, i think and and we are sort of at the end of our discussion as well um, if if some of the listeners could you know uh, bear with us for a bit we would like to take some of the questions as well because some very interesting questions have come up in the that i am being constantly sort of barraged with um, and uh, so i I'll, i'll just maybe close off the discussion with a sense of future as in 
where do we go from here? And this is especially because, you know, I mean, as, as the Tiger Dialogue series has been introduced, this is going to be a series of talks and the next talk goes into the present and the future and what strategies we need to try out for tiger conservation, what are the different models. So it is perhaps good to get a historical perspective on this from, you know, as in, in terms of what history can teach us about what, what things, what decisions might work in the future. And so I'll request all of my panelists, because we are short of time, so maybe just a couple of minutes for each of you to summarize on what your sort of uh, prescription for the future of tiger conservation, wildlife conservation would be uh, in, in, in uh, reference to the learnings of the past. So I'll start with, uh, you know, um, Dr. Ranji Singh, a couple of minutes, and then we go uh, to the other panelists. Very quickly, I would like to emphasize upon the need of the ecological security of the habitats, which uh, a topic which has not been touched upon. The, the uh, especially in view of the fact that our, our uh, parks and sanctuaries, which in fact are the only havens of hope, as I always keep on saying, for the survival of not just the tiger or of animals, but of your national natural heritage, which to my mind, is, if anything, a little more important than man-made heritages. But anyway, it's a heritage of the nation. And they are the last repositories and the last havens of hope. So you have to protect them. And the tiger will suffer or benefit the most from their management. Uh, oh, keeping in view, of course, again, and that's a very difficult the balance of the requirement to the people. But then... Are we going to save only that which remains after save, after meeting with the needs and the greed of everybody? Is that what we are planning for? Is that the objective? Is that our, uh, our uh, policy? If so, we have to say, like we say, that you cannot trespass on certain things, that you will not allow, say, blasting, uh, close to the Taj or you won't dig close to the uh, uh, Ajanta and Alora. Certain things will have to be, you see, in in, in nature, in, in conservation, there are always uh, uh, alternatives, most of the time. And we give those alternatives. They cost more. But they have to be done only in a few cases where you cannot allow the Rubicon to be crossed and you say, ye nahi ho sakta. This cannot happen because certain things have to be saved. Certain things have to be sacrosanct. That's one part. The second is the resolution of the man-animal conflict. And the third I would like to highlight, which has not been touched upon, is the growing impact on wildlife, nature, but mostly on the tiger, by tiger tourism. It is a demeaning experience to see a tiger there. And people, unfortunately, do not go to a national park for communion with nature. They go, as I say, rather crassly, to ogle at a tiger. And if you want to ogle at a tiger, why do they spend the money? They can go and see the magnificent animal in, <laughs> in a safari park. Why, why impinge yourself? So we must change that into a park experience, into communion with nature, of savory nature and wildlife, of which the tiger is an integral part. Thank you. That is that is a wonderful thought. I, I think what you touched upon tiger tourism is very interesting because uh, you know I was discussing with my you know with the team and I, I one of the things that we discussed was that in some ways what the shikar era where you know the urban class would go to get the you know the physical trophy of a tiger has been sort of in the modern age been replaced by the urban class going to get the digital trophy of a tiger as in through photographs and stuff. So it, it is rather interesting. I would like now, now Dr. Sonali to please come in and with a couple of minutes of what, what her uh, you know future prescription would be. Oh, uh, Dr. Sonali, you're, you're un, uh, sorry, you're muted. Uh, yeah, can, I, can some... yeah, I think somebody has to unmute me. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're yeah, okay. 
no, no, thank you so much and, and wonderful again and great uh, Raza, you're a very able son of a very able forest officer. So great, wonderful, you know, hosting of this. Um, yeah, and I think I'll go by the popular vote. I was also reading the chat box. So the votes go in for walking the forest. So yes, that's that's the lesson that we get from the past. And as the young officers and young people there out there, we have to invest in the human resource and give the due respect to the forest frontline the green warriors who are protecting our forests, not just for the animals, but for also preventing uh, conflicts uh, in terms of human animal conflict. So that's one lesson. The number two, I would also say is the respect for diversity of governance and, and kind of you know emerging and evolving into different management systems, if, if I may say, for different areas. So those are my two takeaways. Thank you. That, that is that is very uh, you know perceptive and thank you for the kind words uh, doctor um, i i'd like to now get uh, with uh, vijay to please you know give your sort of uh, closing thoughts a couple of minutes and then we go on to professor oh somebody needs to unmute uh, professor yeah, there is some, uh, okay. Thanks, uh, some yeah, will, yeah, 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 you are unmuted please, please go ahead yeah. thanks for this wonderful discussion i learned so much from the forest offices. I've been researching in colonial times. Uh, so actually, uh, tiger conservation along with wildlife, like you know, uh, MK Ranjit Singhji has said, uh, should be taken as a priority. Uh, but I, I, I'm also against you know excluding the local communities. Like someone mentioned about Gujars somewhere, but also Baigas were excluded in the Kanha National Park. Their uh, knowledge system must be taken into account into wildlife conservation practices. Other thing also, the tiger conservation, we have to understand their psycho animal psychology. We shouldn't think like, you know, uh, anthropocentric perspective. Rather, we should move to biocentric and ecocentric perspective, where humans are part of whole ecology, whole environment. So it should be, like Mahesh mentioned, ecological patriotism should move to um, individual responsibility, societal responsibility, and government governmental responsibility there we can find uh, a possible if not a permanent solution for the future conservation of our wildlife including tigers thank you thank you so much uh, professor ramdas I mean, insightful as always uh, and now you know professor uh, rangajan over to you to sort of close this off oh, uh, i think somebody says the professor somebody needs to uh, unmute you uh, or, yeah please, please word <coughs> well, you're muted again. Okay. Thank you. So students of history are not qualified to give prescriptions for the future. We know that the future is an unknown country. What we can say is where are we today and why are we there? So let me look at two, three very simple positives. You may have seen news report last few days, you know, India has reached uh, the TFR that is the net replacement reproductive ratio. So population growth is a thing of the past. But I think that the real challenge is there are three kind of ways you could look at areas where tigers are. Found. Peninsular India, most of the southern states, western Indian states, economically are in a very different trajectory from much of North India. They are more urban. Industry is, uh, uh, takes up much more of the per capita income. There is much less pressure on the land. I was looking at uh, Tamil Nadu, GDP's agriculture is not even 12%. If you look at the four tiger reserves, demand for fuel wood is gone. The population is not only urban, it's per capita income and wage rates are higher. I think in North India, the sharpness of the conflict is higher. The agricultural productivity is lower. The wage rate is lower. And uh, these forest areas, the number of people who depend on the land and forest is also larger. And the gap perhaps between administration and some of these sections sometimes can be bitter, often sharp. Northeast, it's a completely different situation. So as a citizen, I think one thing very emerged very interestingly today. It seems in the early period of this project, Tiger and Conservation, there was a sense of mission. This is true of all institutions when they're young. You know, people say, I'm not doing a job, it's a mission. And I think that this has emerged in very, very moving stories. I'm sure it's true today, still in a lot of places. But one of the problems of conservation is today there's a lot of money in it. And uh, I'm very struck by what Dr. Ranjit Singh said. These 
uh, half a dozen tiger reserves, there's enormous wealth being generated, particularly for tiger tourism operators. And the tiger task force had suggested, I don't know how many people recall, 30% of the money, the proceeds should be divided locally. Nepal goes to 50%, something that obvious has not happened in India. So can we have a different partnership with citizen science community? And that partnership has to go well beyond the tiger reserves. If it is to succeed, it must be part of a much larger environmental transformation. So I think in the next 50 years, the challenge will be that. How do you craft this citizen science community partnerships? And perhaps you'll forgive me for saying, I don't think we've been that good at doing that in the last 50 years. There are many things to celebrate about last 50 years. Very few people would have predicted that these reserves, so many would have remained intact. You know, when you look at Indo-China, it's ravaged by war. Southeast Asia, they are very rich countries, but frankly, they haven't fared as well. China, we know the story of the South China tiger. So India and the neighboring countries, Bhutan, Nepal, Bangladesh, it's quite remarkable. But in the next 50 years, it's going to require very different kind of uh, intellectual, social, cultural alliances. And, uh, you know, as I said, it's an unknown country. I think I was looking at the names. There are so many people in this audience who could have added a lot. And I, I'd really love to know more from them. And thank you, everyone. And I do want to say that you've done a remarkable job as moderator. Thank so you. Let us hope this spirit of con conversation continues in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, and you know, what a remarkable session. We come to an end of you know, uh, close the session. We could have gone on for till the cows come home, as we say. Uh, but uh, um, you know, um, you know, we are terribly out of time. Uh, but uh, you know, the, you know, I think we could take a few questions. Um, you know, we know that uh, all the valued listeners have their own time commitments. So, in case somebody wants to leave, they can catch up on the question on recording. But uh, you know, we'll we'll just quickly take up a few questions. My, you know, the, the team at uh, you know who has been working much harder than me has very kindly summarized some of the questions. So, um, I'll 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 start with uh, you know one question that has been sort of summarized from different people: so Asar, Rishika, uh, Suvankar, uh, Sudeep. And uh, this is some goes something like uh, what may be the best strategy to tackle increasing interaction of tigers with people as human development has made inroads into tiger habitats, expanding cities, infrastructure has aggravated the situation, and the tolerance of people, especially city dwellers, um, is at the lowest. Some foresters are suggesting shooting down tigers whenever they venture outside protected area. Is that a solution? Tigers are increasingly occupying habitats outside protected areas. How prepared are the territorial units of the forest departments to deal with these situations? And finally, how do you perceive you know, the, cor the, the, the concept of corridor conservation in the context of human carnivore co uh, coexistence and in terms of you know, environmental protection and, and, and whether environmental protection and development can go hand in hand? Uh, so a lot of questions have been sort of gelled together to get this synthesis. Um, and I would request all the panelists to, you know, whoever wants to take this up and go with, you know, with it. So please, uh, the floor is all yours. So somebody needs to, I guess, uh, unmute. I guess maybe Dr. Sonali can take up the territorial forest question because that is sort of a very specific forest department question. Okay. Oh, oh th okay. Thank you. I think we get a chance only when we get to be unmuted. So <laughs> good to have this question. And there were quite a few of the questions, if I've understood correctly, about territorial forests. So basically, we are looking at, again, management systems where there are setting aside protected areas, and there are these reserved forest areas which are under the territorial divisions. Now for the, and I'm assuming it's a mix of an audience, you know, I do see a lot of luminaries and experts in the audience, but we do have the tiger reserve concept always has a core and a buffer area. So, so it's basically uh, the buffer is where you do get a lot of territorial forest or reserve forests, which were erstwhile into production forestry, but, you know, kind of now uh, used for primarily for conservation. So, uh, Having said that, I mean, only until yesterday, it, there was on 29 July, we had the Global Tiger Day. And I was reading a very happy news, uh, which we came into the paper today about setting aside inviolate areas for tigers. And I think this uh, is a good news because uh, what uh, Ranji Singh sir was selling uh, earlier, it's about, you know, when we are saying that there will be, be no infrastructure 
in, in the core areas. It is basically, you know, targeting that we don't want too much of tourism coming into areas and, and kind of uh, creating a stress for the animal to move out. There is enough evidence, scientific evidence to say that tigers do need certain inviolate areas and, and they would not really venture into human habitations the way other cats like leopards or the other smaller carnivores would do. So they would effectively like to stay inside a deep jungle and that's how we should leave them. So so yes, so I guess if, if the inviolate areas are secured which and and if that uh, the the reserve forest, the territorial divisions are also managed in a manner that it provides much more prey base, probably the conflict situation will be less. So thank you. Yeah, that that is a wonderful answer. I think we might have to rush through another question. We might have missed some. I'm really sorry to the audience for that. Um, it's sort of entirely my fault as a moderator for letting this, uh, you know, not keeping time. But uh, one of the questions that comes from the historical, uh, you know, discussions that we have had is that uh, conservation came from the top, despite India being a no vegetarian country. Uh, I guess some would argue, some of the listeners would argue against that argument, perhaps that a lot of our, you know, population is non-vegetarian. Uh, but anyway, uh, law-abiding country, as, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Ranjit Singh said. Um, so, um, an indigenous community at the same time, and, and this is in context of when we were discussing the role of Maharajas and elites of the country in large-scale killing of tigers, and then at the same time, the indigenous communities were alienated and their access to forests taken away over the years, first by the British. And then some would, as argue, the new government of or successive governments of independent India through various conservation legislation that imposed various restrictions on uh, forest use. Um, how would we expect them to show collective action towards bottom up conservation on their own if they have such a, if, they, if the local people have such a sort of history of oppression throughout, you know, uh, the the centuries, and uh, this this sort of which which might have resulted in taking away their sense of ownership and damage their cultural connection with the forest in, in many years in many ways. Something the the the, the disappearance of uh, you know sense of ownership that Ranjit Singh sir uh, you know hinted at. So maybe Professor Rangarajan, if you could take this one up, please. It's a very large question. It doesn't have an easy answer. One way to see it is that institutions and practices evolve and change. You know, democracy was new to India. India was a country with centuries of monarchy. And uh, 1952 election, first time there was universal franchise. And you can see in 15 years, in many of the states, the ruling party was thrown out. So new practices can evolve. And... Uh, one of the very interesting uh, significant points is that the constitution in India provided for a variety of uh, uh, ways in which these issues could be addressed. So there is a notion of the fifth schedule, the sixth schedule. Uh, they provided for protection of land and forest rights. I must add that many times these are observed in their preach. If the land forest rights in these scheduled areas had been observed, many of these issues would not have come up. But we know that constitutional government is a struggle between the, the law that is written and the actual practice. You're seeing it in highly developed countries. Yesterday, you know, World Conservation Nature Day, there was very interesting write-ups on a variety of uh, uh, local community level conservation systems in India. The Bishnois are only one. I am very hesitant to use the word indigenous. For me, everybody in India is indigenous. And you know, this is a very sensitive political topic. And uh, I do want to say that on the ground, there are enough instances of functioning units. One can look at the Gram Sabha, one may look at the Panchayat. The question is, can they be effective in this rate? And yes, they may or may not be, just as state governments may or may not be. And this is a very major challenge. How do you have democracy which is accountable and able to deliver? But I think there is, you know, just compare India to China. And when China went through the Cultural Revolution, Southwestern China, since they were all interested in conservation, you look at a book by Chris Coggins, The Tiger and Pangolin. Under Mao, the tiger was declared a counter-revolutionary bandit. They actually had teams killing the tigers and posing, and they were extolled as great heroes. Such a process did not happen in independent India. So there is much more of our cultural systems and practices intact. We have to build on them in a positive way to address the new issues. 
So I, I, I'm happy to discuss it later and engage with others, but one shouldn't be disappointed about it. There's a lot to be very positive about it in this country. And I think the Bishnois is one instance one can multiply. It. Now, how do we strengthen those instances? That is a wonderful thought. And I thought I would never hear the um, words uh, bandit, you know, for a tiger uh, in terms of China. But uh, so this sort of wraps up our uh, session. Um, we are, I mean, I, I, it has been such a learning experience for me. Um, and I'm sure the audience must have uh, learned a lot as well. Uh, there are some questions that I could not take up. I'm very sorry about that. But I promise you that you please stay tuned for the Tiger Dialogue series because a lot of the questions that you've asked, they'll be taken up by specific sessions in future, which will have experts from the respective domains, uh, you know, taking them, up, uh, taking them up. So hopefully your questions, if you please do tune into future sessions, your questions will be answered, you know, uh, there as well. Um, and uh, thank you so much, everyone. I have just put in my email address as well in case there are some very specific historical questions or other questions that you want to take up with the panelists and couldn't be addressed here. Uh, please feel free to email them to me and I'll have them forwarded to the panelists for, for a reply. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And I think I'll now let the uh, host take over for the closing notes uh, and sort of uh, uh, just brief snippet on the next session. So uh, I think Abhishek, who who would be taking it up for an hour, Abhishek, please. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Raza. And first of all, I'd like to, you know, thank everyone here for, you know, being so lively. And as, you know, as always, when you hear so many people, you kind of lose track of time. Uh, we have overshot, but again, thanks so much. Uh, and a special thanks to, you know, the panelists, Dr. Ranjit Singh, uh, Mahesh, uh, Vijay and Sonali, thank you so much for your time again, and Raza for doing such a wonderful job. Uh, yeah, thanks again. So, uh, you know, again, I... sorry, uh, Abhishek, I think you got muted. Uh... Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'll I'll end this by uh, you know further inviting all of you. Uh, thanks so much for turning up in such large numbers today. I'll uh, you know we'll keep this invite open for all of you to join us on further Tiger Dialogue series. Uh, we're going to have one towards the end of August. Uh, please watch out for the same spaces that you probably found uh, the notice to this one, uh, where we will you know uh, bring together a panel uh, that talks about how tiger conservation goes into the future. Uh, just to kind of give you a, a kind of a quick uh, update, uh, between now and the next session, there is likely to be a, a high-level, uh, you know, multi-government uh, tiger summit that's going to be held in Delhi. Uh, so that is, uh, that next session of ours is going to follow straight on from that and probably take lessons, uh, you know, to how, how tiger conservation is going to be dealt with in the future. And for that, you know, I, I'd like to just, point out two things that came out of this session. Again, I would have loved to summarize a lot more, uh, but I think two things that quickly jump out at me from what we've heard today is I think the respect for diversity of governance that uh, Dr. Shonali brought up, I think is, is key going forward. And, and I think also, um, I think a renewed sense of mission uh, that uh, we need as we go forward is again, very important. Again, there's a lot that needed to be unpacked from the conversations we just had, but uh, you know, this is as quick as I could get with it. Uh, thank you again. Thanks to everyone. Thanks for uh, participating. And certainly thanks to the team at the back end, uh, which involves uh, WCS India, WWF India, and uh, Panthera as well for making this happen. Again, thanks and see you all very soon. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Abhishek. Thanks, Raja Ford. Thank, yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank, been, you. thank you, sir. It's been a, a very, very, very uh, fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. Hello. Hello, Bittu. How are you? Hi, Bittu, sir. I can see you, sir. <laughs> I've, I've seen 12 people today, six of them after 10 years and two after 40 years. Wow. <laughs> I mean, they've slightly changed, but not very much. <laughs> very nice. You did a great job. It is, uh, yeah, gone thanks, Rosa. Great thank job. You. It's been uh, Time flew past. <laughs> yeah, it did. So, uh, I'm going to have to go back and listen to this all over again because it was yeah. great. And uh, it, uh, just, just a lot. So, so we'll be engaging with you and, and following up. And there's there's so many conversations to be had. Uh, just so but you've changed, you've changed laws of physics. 
Normally in these conversations, there's a lot of heat and very little light. Today there was a lot of light and not much heat. I mean, Pinto is laughing. It's true. It becomes so emotional and everybody has strong views and we respect everybody. But, you know, it becomes a very, uh, as I said, heat, heat and not light. Great. Uh, really. I'm glad that we could, we could end then on a laugh, laughing note, if, if that <laughs> makes sense. You know, we, Raza and I are looking for a very interesting clip we are not finding on YouTube. Salim Javed wrote a screenplay of film Zanjeer, very famous, in which the hero is Vijay. His friend is a Pathan called Sher Khan. He's a good Pathan. So, you know, Sher Khan. But in that, uh, somebody gives uh, money for Supari to Sher Khan to kill Vijay. And he says, Hafiz ke aulad, ab tumhe nahi pata hai, Vijay, Vijay Khan hai, wo bhi ek share hai. Sarkar ne share ke shikar ko band kar diya hai. So now, the share bahut kam hai. No one remember this line. We are the only two. Now, I am asking friends who study cinema, they say, look, it's, it's, you know, in 73 to write this dialogue,